All right. Um, welcome, everyone. I am with Professor Chestnut, and he is here um, in the UK uh, talking about his book, uh, Devoted to Death. And in this book, um, I have been really waiting for the time to actually interview and meet Dr. Chestnut. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for joining me today. I know um, your time is very precious. It's very, you've been very busy in mean, your lectures around the world and your lectures here uh, in the UK. Pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot for the invitation, Mona. It's always gratifying to be able to talk about what I've been researching for the past seven years. Yes, but before we even do that, what I'd like to do is ask you a little bit about yourself. Mm -hmm because I know you are a professor of um, religious studies at VCU. And um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is why Devoted to Death? Why Santa Morte? Why, in fact, um, this area when you talk about religion, you talk about spirituality, you can go in many different directions? Yeah, actually, um, it really was somewhat coincidental. Um, I'm a specialist in religion of Latin America. I was working on what I thought was my third book project on the premier manifestation of the Virgin Mary in the entire world, Mexico's Virgin of Guadalupe. I think you had mentioned the other night that you've actually been to her shrine in Mexico City, which is the most visited Catholic shrine in the entire world. Five to six million pilgrims visit it uh, annually. I was two years into a book project uh, because for my third book I really wanted to tackle a monumental topic and what's bigger than the Virgin of Guadalupe who's not only the Queen of Mexico, patroness of Mexico, she actually is officially the Empress of the Americas reigning over Canada down to Argentina and then throwing the Philippines as well. Anyway, two years into this book project I just wasn't finding the same inspiration and passion that had buoyed my previous research. And within that context of kind of research malaise, in March 2009, I'm on my laptop, I'm checking the morning news, and I see that the Mexican army had gone in on the Texas, Mexico, and Mexico, California border and had demolished some 40 Santa Muerte shrines. Now, I've been going to Mexico for over 30 years. My first trip was 1983. And as a student of religion in Mexico, I was quite aware of Santa Muerte. I thought she was fascinating, but really had never studied her. Well, in that context of, of realizing that she had become spiritual enemy number one of the Mexican government to the point that the Mexican army is called in with backhoes and bulldozers to demolish shrines, I thought, hmm, this might be an interesting topic to maybe move on to and replace Guadalupe since I just don't seem to be making much progress with this book project. And so I took a couple of weeks, I consulted with colleagues, family, friends, and they all kind of unanimously agreed that uh, maybe I should at least temporarily turn my back on Guadalupe and plunge into the Santa Muerte project. I also did a quick Google search and found out that there was precious little literature in Spanish, even less in English. So I thought, wow, maybe I can even crank out the first scholarly book on the subject in English. And sure enough, that's what I did. The book came out uh, four years ago in 2012, Devoted to Death. And to my great surprise, four years later, it remains the only academic book in English on the subject. So yeah, the real catalyst was the news that she had become spiritual enemy number one in the ongoing drug wars because the Mexican government at the time and the Catholic Church had identified her as a narco saint, as a kind of protectress patroness of some of the narco cartels in Mexico. I see. You know, I have to say there's a lot of mystery behind even the image of a skeleton or let's just say the bony lady. Um, I, I am very intrigued as to, as you have gone through your studies, as I have read the book, and you segment your book in case studies, case studies and, and how you've actually done a lot of your interviews. Um, can you tell me, any, or can you give um, the audience any profound um, things that may not be in the book? 
or are, is there anything that you can share with the audience that really, um, really made you think? Wow, this is really deep. Well, yeah, and that's that's a good question. In fact, now I'm working on the new edition, the second edition, which will include some new content that I didn't cover. And I think one of the important themes that I alluded to, but I really didn't cover extensively in, in this book, is her name, Santa Muerte, can translate two ways to, into English. I, I kind of prefer the Saint Death because she really is a folk saint. But you can also translate it as holy death. And translating her name as holy death is really interesting because that's the old kind of Catholic notion of having a good death, of being at peace with your maker and hopefully dying uh, at home in your bed surrounded by loved ones. Now, in the context of Mexico being a killing field in the last 10 years, we're talking about some 100,000 Mexicans dead since 2006 in the ongoing drug war. There's a lot of Mexicans who've died really what they call in Spanish, una mala muerte, bad deaths, unholy deaths. And so even though it didn't come up very explicitly, usually in my interview, interviews with Mexican devotees, this idea of desiring a good death or a holy death is very powerful for lots of Mexicans who feel like death, like they're exposed to death, like death could be imminent. And so that's, that's a really important theme that I'd like to work in the revised dish, edition because even though it didn't come out explicitly, I know it's important for a lot of people having dying at home rather than being gunned down like a dog on the street. Well, you know, mostly when you introduce someone to something or when you introduce an idea, you explain what that idea is. You say, well, this is bad or this is for love or this is for uh, financial gain. And I wanted to do it a little different, whereas that you mentioned what devotees actually uh, work with and how they actually feel. But I'd like you to really introduce Santa Morte to the public because I do feel that there's a lot of misconception or probably a lot of um, uh, assumptions that Santa Morte is the imagery of all skeletal type of um, images out there and they associate Santa Morte with everything skeleton, everything death. Can you uh, elaborate yeah, on that? Yeah, as we were talking about previously, um, especially in social media and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, people from an, around the world, because she's also become kind of a popular icon, commercial figure, um, will throw up random skulls, random skeletons, and put the hashtags on the Muerte, uh, when that's just not correct. And, and you know, we're even discussing how there's some Mexicans who are confused. You know, what is the difference between Santa, Mer Santa Muerte and their folkloric skeleton dame called La Catrina. In fact, I have a whole Huff Huffington Post explaining those differences. Also throw in Day of the Dead as well. So yeah, let me specifically, very briefly define what, what I see Santa Muerte as. I think she fits in this category, a rubric of, of folk saints. Latin America, of course, has thousands of Catholic saints. Latin America is the most Catholic region on earth. 40% of the world's Catholics are Latin American. Mexico has the second greatest, second largest Catholic population after Brazil. And so even though the, the church is in decline, it's still, there's a very Catholic culture there. Despite having all these thousands of Catholic saints, that apparently is not enough for a lot of Latin Americans. Why? Well, where do the where do the majority of those Catholic saints come from? They were born, lived, and died out, and lived their lives here in Europe. Not so much here in the UK, but yes. on the continent, <laughs> right? Uh, and so I think many Latin Americans see them as kind of distant and less approachable than these category of folk saints. Folk saints are mostly real Latin American men and women, born, lived out their lives often die violent, tragic, premature deaths. And then for some reason or another, a few years after their deaths, develop re reputations for being miracle workers. And so you'll spontaneously have devotees often visiting their, their grave site, to start mm. with at least. 
And so from Mexico down to Argentina, there's scores of these folk saints. Um, in Mexico, there's the original so-called narco saint called Jesus Malverde, who's from the notorious state of Sinaloa, which is associated with the most powerful drug cartel in Mexico, the Sinaloa cartel, which of course belongs to Chapo Guzman, who they're trying to extradite to the United States. Um, down in Argentina, there's another kind of cowboy gaucho folk saint called Gaucho Gil. Anyway, there's scores of folk saints, and in many times they are more popular than the canonized Catholic saints because they were they were Latin Americans. Most of them were from the working classes. Most Latin Americans are, are still from the, the working classes. And so they're seen as more personable, more approachable than the Catholic saints. So I think, I think Santa Muerte is best kind of classified as one of these folk saints. However, the great difference that Santa Muerte can be distinguished from other folk saints is that at this point, she can't be connected to any um, individual Mexican woman. That yeah. might happen in the future yeah. as the devotion develops, but at this point, Santa Muerte is the very personification of death itself. And I would argue for that reason, that gives her superior power and thus miracle working capacities over both rival Catholic and folk saints because she's seen as death itself. And if you feel like death might be around the corner, nipping at your heels, which lot of, lot of, not only Mexicans, because the most violent countries on earth today that, that aren't actually at war, like Syria and Iraq, are, are Latin, I mean, Latin American countries. Acapulco, the, 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 the famed uh, Pacific Beach Resort, has the fourth highest homicide rate in the entire world. Acapulco, where I used to go as, as a too. kid. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's been surpassed by Cancun now because, you know, precious few foreigners will go there anymore because of the murder rate. So, um, um, yeah, if, if you feel like death might be coming for you, who better to petition for more uh, grains in the hourglass of life that she iconically holds than death herself? So I love that kind of paradox that she's the, the, the saint of death, yet she has a really important role as the grantor of additional life as well, and that's a really important hmm. part of her appeal. I have a question for you, which I don't think that has been asked, and maybe it has, maybe you can correct me on that. But I was wondering, as a devotee, uh, as there are many devotees, you get many of the, um, uh, the, the spiritual entities out there, or the spiritual, let's just say, um, um, icons out there wanting something. What do you see, or what have you seen in your studies that um, Santa Morte um, really craves uh, to give favors out to the devotees. Because sometimes, of course, and I know you've mentioned there is tequila. Uh, I know that you, you mentioned there is a sweets and things like that. Chocolate. Chocolates, <laughs> exactly. But is there something, because you have some entities out there, some paths that say they want to sacrifice, or they want blood, or they want, is there something dire that you see that devotees are, are leaning more to these days and to really making sure that their petitions are granted? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think as we were discussing a few days ago, um, because there hasn't, I mean, it's really so new, this public devotion, it's only 15 years or less since 2002. Um, and while there is an effort at institutionalizing devotion, um, this leader, Enriqueta Vargas, for example, the one who has a 75-foot-tall fiberglass statue, is really kind of at the vanguard of trying to put different shrines and altars throughout Mexico. And even the one in Queens, New York, and possibly soon here in Brighton, might be under her command. Um, but most of the relationship between um, believers and Santa Muerte is highly personal. I and see. so, so I, I think um, that answer would vary a lot depending on the devotee. But I think I think most people would say that you know Santa Muerte is not materialistic. It doesn't matter how poor you are, but it's the it's the size and strength of your faith and devotion. Even if your altar is nothing but but a votive candle and a piece of chocolate, 
if you give that with with very strong and sincere faith, I think devotees feel like they'll be rewarded for that. So obviously devotees of more means will lavish all I mean, you know, regal regaler her with flowers and top shelf tequila and and top shelf everything that they can afford. But I think most dev devotees will tell you that's not necessary. It's 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 what's in your heart and she knows that. Indeed. Well, to me, that gives a lot of threatening aspects to the Catholic Church because, as you know, I would, I, I'm assuming, you would know better, that um, Mexico uh, is predominantly Catholic. Uh, or am I, am I no, mistaken? No, no, it's still, it's still officially 81% Catholic. 81% yes. uh, Catholic. Mm -hmm. But with that, I'm, I'm assuming the Catholic Church has a divide in really condoning any worship or is it actually worship or is it uh, can you explain the difference between worship and being a devotee because in the Catholic Church you worship wouldn't you whereas this you're a devotee and not necessarily worship or is it a is it a word that that uh, is parallel to the same meaning yeah yeah that that's complicated I think I think worship uh, implies usually a set of rites and rituals that go along with the veneration of a particular deity. And again, since there's so much variety, I think we could say, yeah, definitely there are some devotees who we could classify as worshiping and their primary object of worship is Santa Muerte. Uh, but others would be kind of in a more casual kind of veneration who, who, who also, depending on depending on the type of miracle they're seeking, they might ask it from uh, another saint or from, and, and this is an anecdote I love to tell. So two years ago, I'm at the book launch of my Mexican book in Spanish in Tepito, the most notorious barrio of Mexico City, which is home to the most famous shrine run by Doña Queta, whose real name is Enriqueta Romero. And so she's at my book launch because I did a lot of my, my early research at her shrine with her permission and everything. So she's at my book launch. We're in the only high school in Tepito, Benito Juarez High School. And during the Q&A time after I give my, my talk on Santa Muerte's love sorcerers, just as I, as I did a few days ago here in London, um, Doña Queta gets up. She's about 74, 75 now and tells, tells an interesting story about how she recently was cured of throat cancer. She was a habitual smoker most of her adult life. But she wasn't cured by the Boney Lady. She wasn't cured by La Santa Muerte. She was cured by um, the Virgin of San Juan de, La, de Lagos, or a regional virgin. And I thought that was astounding. Here is the most famous, the pioneer, the godmother mm. of Santa Muerte. The, the reason that it goes public uh, in, at the end of 2001, and here she's telling us that her throat cancer wasn't cured by the saint of death, but by the virgin. So even even some of these leaders out there aren't exclusive in their devotion to Santa Muerte, and that follows the Catholic pattern of really not being so exclusive, unlike you know some kind of more rigid forms of Protestantism, where yes. you're on a very straight and narrow with Jesus Christ. Um, Catholicism, as it plays out, particularly in Latin America, allows for this flexibility, plasticity, um, and since there's so many different saints, um, you might be changing saints. Right, exactly. Well, I was just wondering, is, was there a reason for the surge and, and the extreme fellowship, fellowship and de devoted um, the devotees in Mexico because they wanted to reclaim their own and have power, uh, so does that relate back to some of the Aztec and Mayan times? Um, I mean, how is it uh, something that they found um, enriched within their past that they like to actually conjoin to the present? Yeah, there's no doubt that there is a segment of especially Mexican devotees and Mexican-American devotees who really prefer to see Santa Muerte as directly linked to the Aztec past, and more specifically, um, there's an a Aztec female death goddess who reigns over the 
Aztec underworld called Mictlan, and her name is Mictecasiwato. And so some of the devotees in Mexico and mostly Mexican Americans who think about these things, because again, most mm. devotees most devotees aren't interested in history. They want their miracles yeah, coming and, exactly. and like yesterday, right? <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> right. Um, but like to see her as the latest incarnation, if you will, of Mictecasiwato. Okay. Now, I, I don't, I mean, from a kind of more objective historical point, and my fellow Mexican scholars agree with me, um, we think that the primary influence in her development really was the Spanish Grim Reapers because in Spain, unlike here in Britain or in Germany or the Nordic countries, more often than not in Spain, Italy, and the Mediterranean countries, it was the Grim Reapers, a female Grim Reaper. Right. Uh, in Spain, she's called La Parca or the Parched One. And so I and my fellow Mexican scholars see the Catholic Church bringing over the figure of the Grim Reapers to evangelize the indigenous as the greatest influence in the historical development of Santa Muerte. And indeed, if we look if we look at her iconography, here we this is the female Grim Reaper. You know, uh, seven centuries, eight centuries after her development in Europe. This is not <laughs> this is not the iconography of Aztec goddess Mictecasiwato. But <laughs> But, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this one, but Mexican nationalism, as it plays out today, tends to exalt everything that's indigenous, especially Aztec and Maya, which is interesting because, because my wife Fabiola is from a state that was never called Michoacan, that, was ne that actually repelled the Aztecs, and most of them are very, they hate the Aztecs, they were proud that they repelled the Aztecs. So it's not like all Mexicans universally want to see themselves as Aztecs and Mayas, but mm. particularly in Mexico City, they want to do that. Anyway, in general, Mexican nationalism tends to exalt the Mayan and Aztec past and to reject everything that's Spanish. And that's why a mm. lot of Mexican devotees who think about these things do not want to hear about Spanish influence in her development. Well, with that, I was just wondering, is this becoming more political? Because I've seen lots of, I've seen, uh, I've seen articles of you involved into um, uh, lots of investigations and things like that. And just, just uh, with, you know, the higher powers that be when it comes down to your expertise on news and things like that. Um, would you say that the government is actually looking more into uh, the devotees and everything about Santa Morte? Because I, I, I'm really curious as to why there's such a um, repulsive, or as I say, divide in between it. Maybe it's because of the the corruption, um, and and then the, them seeing that she's actually working for them, or are they afraid? Uh, what is the what is the scare? What's the what's the uh, fear behind all of this? Yeah, there's two things going on both uh, in both in Mexico and the United States. It's because of her association with drug cartels. Again, that's how she came on my radar, right, when I mm, first saw right. them. Uh, and so, and there's no doubt that that is, in fact, I have a whole chapter here on the Black Santa Muerte uh, related with mostly narco crimes and kidnappings and such. There, there's no doubt that that is one of the roles that she plays as kind of narco mm -hmm. saint. Not to, obviously, mo I shouldn't say obviously, but most devotees are not involved in the narco industry. <laughs> yes. But... But she does have that special appeal. Why? Again, because she's the death saint. And if you're a narco, you never know. You're probably going to die before you hit age 25 or 30, right? Particularly mm. if you're a narco underling, as most of them are. Sure, sure. Um, and because she's a folk saint and she's not a Christian saint, it's easier to make petitions that don't square with Christian ethics, right? So... If I want my load of, let's say, methamphetamines, crystal meth, to make it to London okay, then there you it, go. <laughs> it's easier to ask her to bless that load than it is to, to ask a Catholic saint. Although, I'm not saying, I know, I know there are narcos who <laughs> ask Catholic saints, but it's easier to do because at the end of the day, she's not Christian. She's a folk saint. She's deaf. Okay, I'm I'm going to ask you from a from a collegiate and a, let's say a professor of religious studies as you are, 
Um, you, you know, I wouldn't know because I'm not a professor of, uh, of religious studies, but I would assume and I would think that the audience would assume that you investigate spiritually uh, from a historical aspect as well as from a current and a, and a folklore aspect. What about the, the, the deep spiritualness of this? Uh, do you see this or do you see Santa Morte as a, um, well, she's a divider between good and evil if you will, that's that's what I see uh, because of the petitions that she grants. But has there been further study into the spirituality of her, and is she um, an incarnate of a particular or a few deities within her own her own self? Or her, I would say not to even classify her as a male or female. But um, is Santa Morte a multi multi oriented entity uh, into one? Um, because it's a bit confusing how so many strong devotees could give in to the spiritualness of their own religion and then associate it with something that has nothing to do with spirituality. So I was just wondering what, from a university standpoint in your studies, um, have you all tried to gather? This is a spiritual aspect or is it classified as pure folklore? Yeah, I would say all the above, actually. <laughs> Again, because now, you know, I estimate, and we don't have any hard figures, I hope we'll have some, some good quality survey soon, but my best estimate is there's 10 to 12 million devotees uh, today, and this is only after 15 years of being public, because prior to 2001, when she goes public, or the, the skeleton comes out of the sure. closet, 99% of Mexicans had never heard of her. In fact, my 85-year-old parents-in-law from Mexico <laughs> lived in the western state of Michoacan mm -hmm. all their lives, only discover who Santa Muerte is through me, their gringo son-in-law's research. And so that's to tell you how kind of occult, hidden, she was from 90... Now, you know, 15 years later, you couldn't find a single Mexican who has not heard who Santa Muerte is. So uh, there's a whole variety. There's Santa Muerte... There's kind of a fierce Santa Muerte who's employed by, by um, shamans and witches. Uh, a fierce Santa Muerte who is employed for works of, of vengeance and harm towards others. Um, a very kind of unchristian Santa Muerte, that's there. And, and it has been there. That was kind of the occult Santa Muerte before mm -hmm. she goes public. But there's also kind of... For a lot of devotees, and keeping in mind this is a, a historically Catholic country, who see her in a more kind of Christian light and will tell you, oh no, it's it's like heretical to ask Santa Muerte yes. to, to do any kind of work that would violate basic Christian moral precepts. And so there's a variety uh, of these 10 to 12 million devotees of how they view her. Some viewing her more in a Christian vein, some viewing her in kind of a Euro-pagan vein, neo-Euro-pagan vein, particularly American, um, um, white American devotees and some of the Euro devotees. Um, there's the small minority of Mexicans and, and Chicanos who, who see her definitely within the framework of Aztec religiosity. Mm. So there's a whole variety there. Um, but if we blow things up and see the bigger picture, um, there have been death deities in most cultures throughout human history. Um, but what's really unique about her at this time is she is the only female death deity in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas, who actually has the name death, Santa Muerte Muerte, uh, and who, who, I mean, there are some of the African diasporan religions, such as Cuban Santeria, Haitian Voodoo, that do have their kind of um, death deities, death spirits, who inhabit the cemeteries and such, um, who have parallels here. Hmm. Um, there's also the Hindu goddess Kali, both the giver and destroyer of life. And so, you know, she's not the only one there. Anyway, the answer is there's a variety of, of conceptualizations of how devotees see her. Well, what do you see, what do you see her taking this? Because I, you know, she's a strong force within the community that, well, uh, many parts of uh, regions of the world. Um, how big do you see this growing? 
Yeah, that's 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 a good question. It's you know I'm a historian, so it's hard to kind of predict the future. <laughs> Although I, I'm in the media <laughs> making predictions, but so yeah, you know um, I think we're going to see greater efforts at institutionalization, and that's already afoot with the um, leader I mentioned, Enriqueta Vargas, the owner of the giant 75 foot statue, yes. who now has 10 to 12 different uh, temples and shrines in Mexico. I think she's also starting one in Colombia as well, possibly Brighton. I mentioned the one in Queens, New York. I'm yes. gonna actually be at the Queens annual fiesta in, in late August. Um, if she continues to be successful, um, then I think we could see a devotion that kind of mirrors what she's about. And what she's trying to do is really kind of decouple, unhinge it from its Catholic roots. Mm -hmm. Because because Santa Muerte could only have arisen in a, in a Mediterranean Catholic context. There's no way in historically Protestant U.S. Santa Muerte could have developed. This is really kind of a, an extreme form of heretical Catholicism, if you will. Um, so I think if she uh, continues to be successful at institutionalization, we, we might see uh, a certain imposition of, of her forms of worship. But the jury's still out on that. She, she has, there's a lot of um, rivals, fierce rivalry. Uh, yeah, fierce rivalry. So that's that's gonna. Well, that's play out. that. That was my next question, um, leaning towards that because after this grows um, and her fellowship or devotee grows, um, there will be sex among amongst um, the various areas to say, you know, my way works, or this is this aspect of it. Um, there is there's no there's no monitoring there's no um, way to actually make a right or wrong um, am I correct there's there's no I mean how is it going to be contained to a point to say it's true devoted type of um, uh, religion or uh, folklore t um, geared towards yeah Santa yeah that's impossible I mean look at Christianity itself which is divided yeah. into thousands of different denominations yeah, sure. and sects so sure. yeah that sure. that's but what makes it even harder is that that since 2005 in Mexico, it's illegal to actually start a church and call it Santa Muerte. There are temples, but they don't really operate illegally. They don't have all the perks and privileges that you have as a legally recognized uh, religious association. And so in contrast, interestingly, in the United States, where there's greater liberty of worship, mm -hmm you can legally start a church called Santa Muerte. So also also be interesting to see if going forward, if more innovations don't actually happen on US soil because of the greater degree, and you don't have a hegemonic Catholic church in the United States going after you and on a weekly basis condemning you as satanic. Okay, so with that and growing of uh, the uh, devotion towards Santa Morte. You're saying that there are no boundaries towards evil, towards good, towards the uh, petition of um, uh, left or right. Um, you're saying that Santa Morte's altar could possibly be integrated with other entities, other other uh, icons of, of worship or path lines. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that basically it's about the energy, the devotion, the love, the dedication that one gives which will determine the type of, um, let's say, granting of the petition. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Okay. I'd agree with that. So, again, in terms of altars and shrines, for example, you see a great variety. Some people will tell you, oh, Santa Muerte is really jealous, mm. like a Mexican woman, right? <laughs> She's got to be <laughs> super celosa. <laughs> and so jealous that she needs to be alone on her altar, right? Mm -hmm. She doesn't want anybody else there because she's the center of attention. However, most shrines I've seen, the hundreds of, or thousands I've seen over seven years, will have other entities, usually Catholic saints. Maybe the Virgin Guadalupe is there, maybe Jesus, Buddha, Hindu goddess Kali. There's a great variety of that. And so while you might hear that mantra about exclusivity, uh, that's not what I've seen play out. People people tend to be pretty eclectic uh, in their shrines. But yeah, yeah. I'm um, going back. Uh, 
yeah, I, I think I think it would be best to kind of perceive her in general as not moral, not immoral, but amoral. <laughs> amoral. Yeah, I mean, yes, kind I of open, open to any any petitions, perhaps, and including harm and injury against others, perhaps. But again, those with a more Christian orientation will say no. She would never permit um, someone else being harmed at her expense or, or killed because you can imagine there's some narco devotees who ask for rivals to be uh, literally taken out of their path, eliminated. And have you, have you heard of various stories where that has actually happened? Uh, yeah, yeah, there are some cases and the most notorious, there's actually been some cases of human sacrifice too. The most notorious case happened I think four years ago in the northern Mexican state of Sonora where and it wasn't they weren't narcos they were a dirt poor rag picking scavenger family um, who sacrificed three of their neighbors to Santa Muerte including two ten-year-old boys um, led by I guess the mother of the family was kind of the devotional leader in the belief they they said Santa Muerte was demanding human blood in return for bestowing abundance and prosperity on the family and she wanted that human blood and so over a few years they they knifed and sacrificed three of their neighbors uh, they were caught um, incarcerated and so there's been a few cases like that where devotees believe that she wants blood the great majority will tell you no I don't work with blood she doesn't need blood but there are some extremists out there and again it makes it easier because it's 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 illegal to start a church, right? So that makes it even harder to kind of institutionalize it. Uh, so it's easier for the for the kind of extremist outliers to to engage in murderous rituals like that. I see. Well, in closing, could you give um, the audience a couple, uh, let's say, um, facts that probably need to be clarified? Uh, that they know of because I do know that once you put a skeleton on it's Santa Morte <laughs> once you know day of the dead oh that's that that's the day of Santa Morte they really don't know what they're talking about so if you could just give us some um, clarify some myths out there because uh, I do feel that many people have it wrong and especially especially the commercial aspect you go out there t-shirts all over the place uh, skeletons you know they figure you've got a skeleton ring t-shirt hat it's Santa Muerte. Right, yeah. Yeah, Santa Muerte, again, is specifically a female personification of death. Um, this would kind of be a classic representation of her iconography. And, and she is a supernatural figure. Um, the great contrast, again, is to the Mexican folkloric figure called La Catrina, who is kind of represented as a turn of the 20th century elegant skeleton dame who is created by the great Mexican um, graphic artist um, Jose Posadas as a kind of burlesque character to make fun of the Mexican elite of the time who were implementing policies of starvation of the Mexican people, you know, making, turning them into, into walking skeletons, right? Mm. And so this La Catrina is omnipresent in Mexico. You go to a Mexican restaurant, there is La Catrina. La Catrina, mm. Mexicans all grew up with La Catrina, but, but not Santa Muerte, because Santa Muerte... But to confuse this, lately I've seen altars where Catrina figures with her classic um, Parisian-style mm. hat and her mm. flowers are there actually there on Santa Muerte altars to confuse the figure. But yeah, I mean, she's specifically a supernatural folk saint um, who looks like that, usually dressed as a bride, nun, although there's all kinds of variations lately in her iconog uh, iconography. So right, to just throw out any skull, any human skeleton and call that Santa Muerte, not only wrong, but for some devotees, they actually see it as sacrilege. Yes, I would, I would imagine so. Um, well, thank you for your time. I know that you um, are going to other areas of the book um, and having a newer edition. Can you elaborate on that, that you're actually going to have a book that's going to precede this one? Right, right. I'm working on the uh, second edition, which will not only include updates, since I wrote this five years ago, but new content. Um, not only 
the importance of having a, a holy death or a good death, but her really strong following among LGBTQ, I'll put the Q in there too, folks as well, um, on both sides of the border. I think I'll actually put in a whole new chapter of that, because and even a lot of the, le the Santa Muerte leaders, both in Mexico and the United States themselves, are gay and lesbian. So that's an important issue. That I'll cover too. And also her international, I mean, here we are yes. uh, at my talk the other night here in London, there were four devotees, four British devotees. So the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. here she has devotees in Europe who have no connections with Mexican Catholicism, uh, just 15 years after she goes public, really is astonishing. I was also in the Philippines last summer and Santa Muerte, the Philippines, she, and that proves also her Spanish origins because yes. the Philippines is a Spanish colony. Nothing to do with Mexican Aztecs, right? So I was doing research there last summer. The Philippines is the only country in the world where during Holy Week, uh, Santa Muerte is still processed as part of Holy Week as she used to be in Mexico, New Mexico and in, in the States and Colorado. Uh, she used to be, you know, cold, pulled in this death cart. And the only place that, that still goes on is the Philippines. And so I'll probably add some fascinating material to Santa Muerte in the Philippines. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, uh, I tell you, I have not seen such a surge in growth in a, for a particular, in a particular path in, well, ever, actually. So um, I thank you for uh, allowing me to actually uh, even meet you and, and talk to you um, about Santa Muerte because... Uh, this itself uh, is a good book, and honestly, I have um, read it, and um, I think everyone else should too. Yes, I think everyone else should too. <laughs> well, it's been a real pleasure, Mona, and uh, I really appre appreciate the intelligent questions. Um, not don't always get those everywhere I go, so <laughs> uh, I, I really appreciate questions that that uh, lead to new paths and make me think as well. So, Great. thank you. Thank you.